The answer is always no if you don't ask. Oh, hello. Welcome back to the Wild Business Growth Podcast. This is your place to hear from a new entrepreneur or innovator every single Wednesday morning who is turning wild ideas into wild growth. I'm your host, Max Brandstetter, founder and podcast producer at Max Podcasting. And you can reach me at max at maxpodcasting.com to bring your podcast to life and use it as a business building tool. This is episode Uno Uno Ocho, and today's guest is Sarah Groen. Sarah is the founder and owner and travel advisor at Bell and Bly Travel. They are a luxury travel advisory, and she creates magic in terms of travel. She also has an incredible tech background. I'm talking Uber Eats, plenty of spaces in the tech world, in the finance world, I guess fintech world as well. And she shared some awesome tips on building your network of partners, as well as creating simply unforgettable experiences. In a year that has set a record for canceled vacations, I hope this episode will serve as a bit of a mental vacation for you. Let's go global with Sarah. Enjoy the show. Alrighty, we are here with Sarah Groen, the unbelievable leader in luxury travel. I'm sure that is your official title. That's how you introduce yourself everywhere. But <laughs> the, the founder of Bell and Bly Travel with just an amazing background all around. Sarah, thanks for joining. How are you doing today? Max, thanks for having me. I'm doing great. Awesome. I think we can stop there. No, we, uh, we met a little while back at Podcast Movement Virtual, which was a, a hell of an experience. And I think Overall, they did an awesome job with it, given the circumstances. Really cool to connect there and was just blown away by your story. So we're going to get into your travel company, the travels that you've done yourself and your clients and amazing partners do and what you talk about in your new podcast. Speaking of travel, I want to start by hopping in an Uber. And by that, I mean Uber Eats. And I am incredibly corny. But you used to work at Uber Eats. You were actually responsible for some pretty significant rollouts in a couple of major U.S. cities for Uber Eats. Can you explain that a little bit? Yeah, so I did have kind of a career in finance and tech before I jumped into trying to do the ever cheesy thing of turning my passion into my business. Uh, but at Uber Eats, it was certainly a crazy time. So I was the GM of Uber Eats for Houston and Phoenix and launched both of those markets. And Houston at the time when we launched it was the third city in the world to launch Uber Eats. And I can tell you that we were definitely a startup within a startup. We had had no idea what we were doing in the beginning. And I learned a really important piece about entrepreneurship when I was there, which was done is better than perfect. Uh, so we would roll things out and do them manually until the product team in San Francisco would figure out what we were doing manually and build us a product. And they were fantastic. Of course, they could build something in a week. So we would do something manually and be like, oh, crap, crap, crap for a week. And then they'd have something new for us that week. And then the next week, something else would happen. And then they'd have something new for us. But yeah, it was a crazy time. And it was really fun in the beginning. And you know, we didn't have a brand name. So we didn't just get restaurants to sign up because of our name, Uber Eats. Like We actually went door to door to restaurants to talk to the owners and the managers to see if they wanted to come on the platform. So it was a pretty fun experience. It sounds like it. And you hear about rapid prototyping or iterative process or whatever you want to call it. It sounds like a crazy way to do things, but it can often lead to some of the best results. What advice do you have for anybody who's working on a project that's rapid prototyping and just getting things done rather than perfect like that? Yeah, I mean, I think actually, I mean, that is the advice, keeping that in front of your mind and not letting yourself go off the rails to try to be perfect is really important, right? Because you actually don't know what's wrong with the product or what's wrong with the service until it's out there. And then you can find and see the inefficiencies a little bit better. And then you can fix those in an order of priority that makes sense for your customer and makes sense for your product. I would say, I mean, done is better than perfect is the advice. 
But even further than that, there are a lot of studies that say like the startups that fail are the ones where they're, the team is overarching in either the business element or the engineering element, um, like one or the other, because on the engineering element in particular, a lot of times engineers just want to be perfect. They want the code to be exactly right. They want like the science to be exactly right. And it never gets out. And then the business person is maybe a little bit less focused on that. So if it's all business, they might not even, you know, get the product to a point where it can and get put out. So it's in the startup world, there actually have been some, some studies around that. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, it seems cutthroat, but super energizing. What's something about Uber Eats and enrolling it out, which, I mean, you were involved in such an early stage of that, but what's something about how Uber Eats operates that you think most people who use it, who are customers of Uber Eats would be surprised by? Well, at least in the early days, it was really interesting because most of our competitors at the time were scraping menus and just putting them on their platform so you could order from another app and the restaurant would have no idea that they were doing this order for somebody through a delivery service. What was different about us at Uber Eats in the very beginning is that we had a deal and an agreement with the restaurant owners uh, for every single restaurant that we had on the platform. Um, so each restaurant had an iPad and all of that in the store. So I would say in the early days, that was one of the, the really big differences. It was super behind the scenes. And then the other thing too, I, maybe people don't realize, but Uber and Uber Eats somewhat collaborate because we would have this thing that we called cross-dispatch to where Uber drivers could be Uber drivers and Uber Eats. And so eat, they'll be sitting in their car waiting for a ride, but they might get an Uber Eats, an Uber Eats pickup. And of course they can choose if they want to do both or not. But we did a lot of analysis early on that showed the ones that did choose to be cross-dispatched made more money because they could be on more of what we used to call a continuous trip. Now I will say um, a lot of things have probably changed at Uber since then, so that could all be different. <laughs> but that was that was um, one of the things I thought was really interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's not a giant, intricate company or anything like that. But I've always wondered about that, like how the drivers decided what they were doing one or the other or both or I mean I'd always just wonder if like if I was a driver if my car was always going to smell like food like who knows but anyway it's it's very cool what you did there yeah no a lot of it was personal preference some people would be like I know I don't want to have food in my car I don't want it to smell like food but a lot of female drivers would be like this is amazing I can make money and I don't have to have people in my car at night uh, who I don't necessarily necessarily feel safe with so it totally was preference a lot of times Let's get from transportation to, I guess, more transportation in a sense. Talk about the world of travel. So you have Bell & Bly, your travel company that focuses on the luxury end of things. I'm curious how, how you made this shift to travel in the first place, because it seemed like at Uber, you were kind of more fixed location-wise, I guess, or at least in a certain part of the country. Where did this travel bug come from? Yeah. So, I mean, the travel bug started way before Uber and uh, up until that point, I definitely did have, I did some startup stuff, right? I co-founded an accelerator in Houston and we invested in energy software startups and I I worked at an energy software early stage company as well. Um, and I did finance and all that stuff, but I was definitely not location independent. I was based in Houston for most of that. But the travel bug started when I was 15. I actually got to go spend a summer in Germany because I have family there. So I went to school with my, my cousins and met all their friends and just spent three months living in Germany. And it was a super formative experience. So from that day on, I or that summer on, I loved travel. And I studied abroad twice in college. And then, though I had those jobs mostly in Houston, I would use every single day I could to travel. I've even written um, a really long, like not that long, but a semi long report on how people could visit 10 countries in one year with 10 days of vacation. <laughs> because <laughs> I was like, it's actually possible because if you combine them with holidays in a smart way, you combine it with uh, flying red eyes. And I actually worked out the budget to where you could do it for $10,000 too. So the report, if somebody wants it's it, just 10, send me 10, a note. 10, 10, 10, yeah, it's 10, 10, 10, 10 days of vacation, 10 countries and $10,000. So I always loved it. And I just made it a part of my um, life as much as possible. Of course, like 
you know, the two years I was an investment banker, that was <laughs> really difficult to accomplish. So what I also did is between jobs, I would negotiate for more, uh, more days until I started. So once I was at Uber and I was working, you know, 90 hours a week, some of, some of the time when we were launching these markets and products, I finally just was like, okay, I cannot work this much for somebody else's equity. I have to be putting it into my own. And so that's when I left and I started working on a lot of different things, to be honest. Bell and by Travel wasn't the first one. I did throw up the website to kind of have it as like a side gig. And a couple of friends asked me to help plan their trips, which I did, but I was still looking at other things. It really took um, a deal that I had been working on for a while to sort of fall through for me to like take a look at my life and say, hey, your ego is actually preventing you from going into this thing that you really want to do. And is that is that how you want to live life, right? And so once I could kind of get over that, I said, all right, let me focus on travel for six months and see how it goes. Like, is it an industry that you know, somebody with a business background can actually make money in or not. And I did the experience, right? I started it and uh, put stuff up and started working on things. Done was better than perfect in the beginning. And it, it worked out. Sometimes you just have to get out of the way of yourself, huh? This travel space is really interesting to me. Like I'm, I'm someone personally who geeks out about the trip planning side of things. So I really like discovering things myself and, and putting trips together that way. But I know there's a huge market of people that just don't want to spend the time doing that and are much better off working with somebody like you who can kind of do all the heavy lifting on that end. I, I hate that term. I, I, don't, I can't believe I just used it. <laughs> but do all the work on that end and put together a truly unforgettable trip. What is it that makes working with somebody like you such a benefit over scurrying to put things together yourself for your travel plans? Yeah, that's a, a really good question and one that I have evolved into more over the years. Like in the beginning, I was like, okay, I'm saving, I'm mostly working with executives and other C CEOs of tech companies and things like that. Um, but I'm okay, I'm saving them time and, uh, you know, I'm better at it technically, right? I've been to a hundred countries. I study travel <laughs> all day long. I have relationships. I'll give it to you. <laughs> I have relationships on the ground. And Only because of that one long blog, po that semi-long blog post though. <laughs> okay. Um, right. I mean, for the most part, like n all, none of my clients have traveled more than I have. Right. So I have sort of the experience. That's what I thought was my value. It turns out it's actually, yes, it is the time savings for the client, but it's also helping them decide what they really even want and what they'll really enjoy. So we spend a ton of time up front getting to know our clients. It's it's not a, a sale that I, I have to take very seriously when I get on the phone with a potentially new client, right? I'm vetting them to kind of join the Bell and Buy Travel family almost as much as they're vetting us because I really want clients who are going to kind of play the game so that we can do an excellent job for them. So the game is I get to know them really well up front. So we want to know all kinds of things, right? Like what are your kids' hobbies? What like hopes and dreams for your travel over the next like five years? Are there any big milestone events coming up? That kind of stuff. What are your pet peeves? What don't you like? What was your worst travel experience ever? What was your best travel experience ever? And once I start to understand that, and then I kind of, I kind of know what other clients have liked, I know what the subset of things that are possible in the world is, I can start to pattern match and say, okay, I really, it's almost, it's weird. It's like, as I'm talking to a client about a trip, I can start to sort of see it in my mind, like all the pieces kind of like come out, right? And I'm like, oh my gosh, they would love this. We've got to do this. The daughter loves ballet. So on their trip to Russia, let's do a, let's find a way to do a behind the scenes meet and greet with the Russian ballet company or whatever it is, right? So we can start kind of pattern matching again and pulling that together. So I think it also comes down to our relationships too. So we do have access to experiences that just aren't available online. First of all, you wouldn't know to, go you wouldn't know to Google for something like that behind the scenes Russian ballet company experience. And second, it's probably not on Google because I'm going to have to call my partner who's an expert in Russia and knows everybody on the ground and is going to, he's going to put that together as a bespoke activity for us. I'm feeling a Russian ballet trip on my end. Coming, so thank you for that. <laughs> but it's so cool that you really get to know your customer that well. And it seems like that's what really makes the difference in terms of just putting together a kick-ass trip like that. 
How do you do that? In addition to just asking questions, what are you looking for and how do you structure, how do you dig deep into the mind of your customers? It's funny. It's probably a little bit about, it's probably a little bit like how you prepare for a podcast interview, to be honest. I actually found (laughs) when I got into podcasting, I felt like I was much better at the interview process because I have done hundreds of interviews, quote unquote, interviews with clients. So I do a little bit of research up front and then I I try really hard to get people to give me examples. So I don't ask, what do you like in a hotel or what do you want from a hotel? I ask, what are your top three favorite hotels you've ever stayed at? Um, And if they're the right type of client for us, I know which hotels they they'll say hotels I know already. And then I can really kind of get a vibe from that. And then I can say, wait, these two are boutiques. This one is a large, you know, well-known international luxury travel brand. Like what was it about that one that you really liked since it's kind of stands out? And we can have a deeper conversation then basically just asking like, what do you want from a hotel? Oh, I want a two bedroom suite. And I like to have a good view. Um, So I get a lot more detail from trying to get examples, but the process doesn't really stop there either. So the the whole point is I'm bringing clients sort of into the fold and we want to work with them long-term. So we also do feedback calls after their trip and we go into details on what they liked and didn't like what their top experience was, what the bottom was. We take notes and then those notes get folded into the planning process for their future trips. So we get better over time as well. It's cool to picture it all come together now. It's it's not just like a one and done type thing of, oh, that was an awesome trip and we have the memories from that, but that's kind of all that we can milk it for. Like you're you're working to create unforgettable experience after unforgettable experience for your clients. And and this can really, you know, translate across generations if you know if it's a longtime client like that. So that's really cool to hear about. And a lot of your clients and the partners that you work with are in that luxury space. What made you zero in on luxury? Well, that is a good question because I personally love all kinds of travel. I like love to go to random countries like Uzbekistan and do homestays or- I was going to guess Uzbekistan homes. <laughs> yeah. And, I can't um, even pronounce it. <laughs> yeah, most people don't even know it exists. I've been to Tajikistan. I hiked to a place where, you know, nobody- even can imagine still exists language immersion classes in Nicaragua or whatever it is. Right. So, and I, but I also love luxury travel. So I'm sort of an equal opportunity lover of all kinds of travel. So when it came to the business, it is funny, actually, when I first started, I thought like, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to work with folks and I'm going to help them broaden their horizons. I'm going to create tolerance because people are going to see all these new things in the world. And I'm going to plan all these trips to Uzbekistan. No one wants to go to Uzbekistan, first of all. <laughs> so we'll start there. Um, but um, I zeroed in on the luxury piece, A, because um, that's who my network was when I started the business and the clients that I wanted to work with. My sales process is a lot easier when, when I'm selling to that executive slash entrepreneur because we're similar and they trust me because of my background. But the other aspect of it is you almost have to be focused on some level of luxury to make money in this business. So also a profitable, uh, a more profitable sector to work in. I can't imagine why you're telling me there's more money in the luxury space. Are you kidding me? (laughs) Now, it seems like a a natural fit there. It, It makes a lot of sense. And your partners are in I love your podcast, Luxury Travel Insider, the podcast, and uh, specifically the episode about Santorini took my girlfriend Dana and I back to our trip to Santorini, which you may not have stayed at the place that you talked about with Marco there, but Ia and Santorini are just on a whole other level. So that we can save that because that would be a whole separate four hours of conversation. <laughs> but anyway, you partner with the best of the best, some of the top ranked hotels, you know, in every country on earth that you work in. What advice do you have for building a network of like top notch partners? Because this can apply in the travel world, or it could just apply to anybody who has a service business where they want all star partners like that. Yeah, that's a really good question. The way that I actually did it, and I do think this is applicable to all kinds of industries is to channel partner right? You got to, if you want to grow a web of partnerships really quickly, the fastest way to do it is through a channel partner. So find one way that you can, you can find a channel and that gets you access to a bunch, right? So one example in the travel world um, is that my agency is affiliated with a consortium called Virtuoso. 
and Virtuoso is the, the consortium brings together the top travel advisors and the top um, hoteliers and tour operators in the world. And the tour operators and the hoteliers agree to give special perks to the clients of the top travel advisors. And both sides pay to be part of this consortium. The guy who owns the consortium, he's a genius. <laughs> we should all have his business. <laughs> but anyhow. You know how those consortium guys are. Yeah, so you know, for so being part of Virtuoso when I first started gave me access to all these partners, and then I could go to the Virtuoso conferences and get to know them. But then I took it a step above and beyond because there's a ton of other travel advisors who are Virtuoso too, right? So before I would go to one of these conferences, I would send, um, you know, really simple an email introducing myself, saying, "Hey, we're going to meet at Virtuoso Travel Week. This is about me. This is the type of client I work with. These are the types of experiences they're interested in. I'm super excited to meet you." And I got so many responses from that email, like, "Wow, a travel advisor has never sent us this before, right?" So it's kind of like the simple things that yeah. other people don't think of. So I would say channel partner, and then take it above and beyond. And now even with Luxury Travel Insider, the podcast, you know, I have relationships at all these hotels that I'm working with, but I'm getting a much deeper relationship now with Marcos because he was on the show with the GM of the one and only Mandarina, which just opened this past weekend. And I have a client there right now. The GM emailed me to tell me like he got, he did, you know, a special cocktail for them when, when they arrived. The GMs almost never talk to travel advisors, right? It's usually a salesperson. So I'm sort of deepening those relationships by doing other extracurricular things like the podcast and and trying to to build them. Yeah, you're really cutting through and, and standing out in this space, which it's it's no wonder it's paid off for you. And you have such amazing partners and, and clients like this. How has building a travel business been overall compared to what you would have expected before you started? That's a good question as well. So before I started, I think I mentioned before, I actually didn't really know if you could make money to being a travel advisor. And, you know, the stats out there are pretty dismal, but it was really hard to kind of cut through and kind of figure it out, right? Because A, a lot of people, a lot of people are super small businesses. They don't report what their income is. So there's no really good statistics. And then B, a lot of travel advisors are part-time. They're not really focused on business. It's kind of something they do for fun on the side, which is fantastic. And I totally love that and respect that. But I, it gave me sort of no way to know, is this really like a potential real business? So, you know, it definitely was taking a risk to say, I'm going to give this um, a go for six months. And then I also was a little bit worried, like, would I like customer service, right? Like uh, if I have somebody traveling around the world and it's, you know, midnight on a Saturday night and they need help and they're grouchy, you know, am I, how am I going to react to that? Right. Having been like an executive at other companies before being a luxury traveler myself, right. i um, viewing myself almost as like a peer of my clients. And <laughs> how is that going to go over? Right. So, well, I, so I guess the surprising part was that I actually do like it very much. I love the customer service aspect. I love to feel like I'm literally helping people have experiences they otherwise would absolutely not get to have. So I love that piece. And knowing that I think I was kind of worried about the other pieces in the beginning, I was able to build things into the business around that, right? So we're pretty... We really, this is another reason we focus on luxury. So when we focus on luxury, we work with partners around the world that um, have sort of 24 hour assistance for the clients when they're traveling. So if something happens like a a train strike in Italy, I'm not going to get that call. My partner on the ground in Italy is going to get it and they're going to do a fantastic job fixing that and helping the client on the ground because I don't want the client waiting on me if it's 2 a.m. when they um, have their, their strike and they need to hear from me. Right. That has to help so much. And I'm foreshadowing here. I think you're going to get a call from me in the middle of the night when I'm having some issues with my leotard when I go for those Russian ballet training. So just a heads up on that. All right. <laughs> <laughs> just, just fair warning there. That's an image for you. And here is a website for you, maxpodcasting.com. I promise no images of me in ballet gear. I know that's the proper term maxpodcasting.com. Let me know if you are intrigued. Now, back to Sarah and her global journeys, plural. So let's switch gears a little bit. Let's get into inspiration and creativity. And since you have traveled so many places and work with so many places that are just 
I mean, like the coolest places in the world. What to you makes a luxury experience truly unforgettable? Yeah, so you need to have something you need to have something out of the ordinary to be memorable and unforgettable. And there is actually a lot of science around this too. So we definitely think about it when we're designing trips for people. And remember, it also doesn't happen just when you're traveling. It also, the anticipation phase of traveling has actually been shown to, to make people as happy or sometimes happier than the actual travel themselves. So we take advantage of I was going to say, even just planning like a little weekend getaway, it just, there's some sort of inherent boost there. It just, it pumps you out. It just gives you something a little extra to get excited for. Yeah. And we take total advantage of that, right? So if we have a family who's going to Greece and it's maybe six months away or something, right? We might send um, a set of Percy Jackson books to the kids so they can start reading about the Greek gods and get really excited, right? Something that we know kids like. And, you know, for a family going to Costa Rica over Christmas, we might send them Costa Rican recipes they can make with leftover turkey the day after Thanksgiving. Um, just stuff that they can, they can do to think about the trip and get excited about it. So that's one piece, but then when you're actually traveling, okay, I mean, just sort of, these are my travel advisor secrets, right? Like you have to start the trip super smoothly, like no airport pickup misses, right? That has to happen pretty smoothly. Then build from there, not the nicest hotel on your first day and then down from there, right? Has to build from there. And then peaks within, the trip, right? So a couple unexpected moments. We know from science that if things really take you out of your comfort zone, whether there's something really unexpected or something really different than what you're used to in your regular everyday life, that you'll remember those a lot more. And don't forget, I've also already asked my clients, what would make this a wow trip for you? And what are your favorite travel memories from the past? So I kind of know what memory, what types of memories already stick out for them. So we, um, we focus on those types of experiences when we're building the itineraries too. That's really cool. The science angle of it. What do you think makes something memorable? Like I know there's a lot of contributing factors to it, but if you were to kind of, you know, quote unquote, dumb it down, like what is the quickest way to make something memorable? just for it to be very different than what your everyday life is. So when you ask people what their most memorable experiences are, they're either going to say something memorable because it was so crazy good and so crazy different than what they're used to or so crazy bad. You know, we missed the train and then we got stuck and we had to sleep in the train station. But like that memory is that never leaves anybody. That's not a good one. That's not one we want to happen for our clients, but it's sticking out in your mind because of how different it is than your everyday life. Absolutely. And just to, you know, continue talking about Santorini. Well, actually, this is about Mykonos. But on that same trip, we had heard that there was this cooking class, which was like a must do, you have to do it in Mykonos. And Dana and I, we both love cooking. So we're like, all right, this will be cool. But I mean, the cooking class was incredible in itself. But what really made it that much more memorable was who was leading the class afterwards said, hey, you know, my cousins are having a a private party on their farm a little while away. They don't do this often. Would you guys want to bring all the food there? And they're singing and dancing and we can eat outside and, you know, live music and all that. So we, we had this exclusive experience that was a total surprise, you know, even on top of that cooking class. On your end, what are some memorable experiences that either you've had yourself or maybe a client had that just kind of blew the roof off everything? Gosh. Um... <laughs> I know it's, so, I, we, like, we don't have time for like all 16,000, but to yeah. one or two of them. I had a family go to Finland over the holidays a couple years ago. And the parents were actually like worried that the kids were stopping to believe in Santa Claus. And so <laughs> in that pre-travel phase, I found some woman on Etsy who makes letters from Santa Claus and they looked like super legit, um, like tied with a red and white piece of twine and like handwritten in cursive and all this stuff, right? So I fed all this information to this, this lady with the parents' permission, of course, the kids' teachers' names, like their best friends' names, like what their favorite things are, what they've been bad about lately, what they have been good about. And she wrote these super detailed letters from Santa Claus. <laughs> and I know you're coming to visit me. And like, I know that you haven't been being good in this whatever and miss so-and-so, your teacher and your best friend, Bob, Bobby or whatever. So the letters, first of all, they were pretty 
convincing. And then when they got to Finland, we had these really special activities, like super private activities set up in the, in the middle of the forest. Like imagine a snowy, like glistening forest. And these two elves like came to their hotel dressed in really great elf costumes and picked them up and took the whole family to the secret secret mission control uh, where Santa was. Um, and so first they went in and they got to talk to the elves and read some bedtime stories or whatever it, it was, right? And then they had like a private audience with Santa there. I mean, there was a few other things, of course, too. They did ice fishing, which is super memorable and um, snowmobiling and all kinds of other stuff. But the parents um, afterwards were like, oh my gosh, like every kid on the block now believes in Santa Claus because of the stories they've told after they <laughs> got home. <laughs> so that's yeah. a pretty good one. That is. And if you're a kid listening and heard that part at the beginning and might have some questions about Santa Claus, don't worry, because I will be interviewing Santa Claus next week and we'll clear all that up. But I love how you go so over the top. These trips are so custom. It's so different than, you know, as I was saying before, kind of my uh, amateur example of just Googling some stuff and putting a trip together in like an Excel file like that. Like you really, really get to know your clients. You really, really understand them so well that you can unlock these magic and memorable moments. It's really neat that you're doing this in places that are so exotic and, and so cool. Let's get to a fan favorite segment called the wild business shout out of the week. The wild business shout out of the week. And here we have a, a special guest appearance from Santa. No, I'm just kidding. Wild business shout out of the week. This is where we talk about a, creative marketing campaign and ad that caught our attention. And there's something with Lindblad that kind of a pivot they did. That's really, really cool. Do you mind sharing what you saw there? Yeah. When I was thinking about this, I was thinking, you know, what, what in travel have I seen recently that was really inspiring and I mean, we're recording this in 2020, so it's been a really tough time for the entire travel industry because of COVID. But one of my favorite um, expedition ship companies is called Lindblad. You probably know them better by the name National Geographic Explorer because that's sort of the, the brand oh, name that's, um, on oh, their ships. I, if I would have known that, I would have just said that right away. I, I was worried <laughs> about how I'd pronounce Lindblad. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, so so the you can, so National Geographic Explorer boats will go to like Galapagos, Antarctica, Alaska, and these ships carry about maybe a hundred people, one hundred and twenty people. It's not a, a cruise ship experience that you might think of. It's really really customized and personal, and awesome. And they have great kids programs. So in the kids programs during during the day, you might have. Um, the kids with a scientist and they collect plankton and they get to look at the plankton in a microscope and then they have a special lunch for the kids and then um, everybody does stuff with their parents for a bit but then they have like a kids session where they learn how to drive the zodiac boat or whatever it is so when COVID hit Lindblad slash National Geographic came out with these virtual expeditions every day they would come out with an itinerary for the day and they would say you know here's a video uh, to, to look at the plankton that we caught in in Galapagos and here's some recipes that you might try for lunch that come from you know our recipe book from our Alaskan um, cruises and then in the afternoon they might have a craft or something so they had these sort of virtual experiences that they they pushed out to us and to clients every day which I thought was really nice and kind of a for I mean for us it was definitely an escape from thinking about the day-to-day -day <laughs> doldrums of COVID and canceling trips at that time. Yeah, absolutely. And this year has proved that, you know, there's no limit to the number of events or experiences that you can turn into a virtual sense and still, obviously, it's not quite the same, but still have a positive experience and still brighten someone's day. So that's another really, really cool, just out there example. You mentioned Plankton. I haven't heard Plankton talked about so much since like Plankton, the character from SpongeBob, if they could bring that character to life, I think there's a whole you know, a whole nother level of, uh, of coolness there. <laughs> you got to travel more. You'll hear about plankton, different types of clouds, different types of rocks. I just did a 10 week road trip across the U S I learned more about geology, I think than I did <laughs> in all my years of schooling. And I worked yeah. at a geophysical company for a while too. So it's saying a lot. Oh my God, that rocks. See what I did there. <laughs> all right. Let's wrap up with some rapid fire Q and a you ready for it. I'm ready. All right. What it, this is probably the hardest question in the world for you. What is your hands down favorite place you have ever traveled to? 
First of all, I knew you were going to ask that, and it's such a trite question. Damn it. <laughs> <laughs> and I never have an answer. I was working on that one for months. <laughs> I never have an answer. I love some, like, they're, I mean, this is like my life, right? They're my children. I love them all. <laughs> I, gosh, if I had to say, I mean, I can narrow it down by continent, right? I, I love Colombia in, in South America. I think it's often overlooked. The trip that I kind of already alluded to, to the five stands in Central Asia was insane. Was that with the Tajikistan? Yeah, Tajikistan, Turkmenistan, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, and Kazakhstan. Um, and all Turkmenistan, the stand, the stand. You know, I'm a stand well, of the trip. Not all of them, but five of them anyway. <laughs> Turkmenistan was just the craziest place I've ever been, if I had to say that. I mean, we went to this crazy pit that is a, is a natural gas well that ex- sort of fell in on itself when the Soviets were drilling it 50 years ago, I think now. Oh my God. And they, they never completed the well, but um, gas was leaking out of it. So they thought, okay, we'll just flare it, which means burn it in oil and gas speak. So we'll just throw fire on it and then it'll burn out and it'll be over and it won't be leaking gas, which could hurt people or the environment. It's still burning 50 years later. Like to be in the desert with nobody else around standing next to this crazy oh fireball. My God. It's called the the gates of hell is like the nickname. I think I've heard of that before. I have no idea about the background of that, but. The government there is really interesting and different. I'm probably not going to be able, able to go back now, but yeah, super weird. <laughs> um, people say that like Ashgabat, the capital is like a weird cross between Pyongyang in North Korea and Vegas. And I have been to Vegas and I have not been to Pyongyang, but I can imagine. And it was sort of like that. Like we were very controlled. We couldn't walk around on our own. There were certain places that we couldn't get within like two blocks of. Everything is made out of white marble. Everything is empty. There was nobody there. It was super weird. So like I said, uh, the crazy things are the ones that really stick out in your memory, right? Definitely. That is a hell of a combo there, those two so cities. It's not, yeah, I mean, it's not my favorite country I've ever, like, that I want to go back to a bunch of times, but that's a, an amazing memory. Right. But it, yeah, if you stare down the gates of hell, that is a hell of a memory. What is a tip you can share about getting over jet lag? I think it's really important to plan your trip. This is super boring, but it's really important to plan your flight to sleep at the right hours of your destination when you get on the plane. And I know this is hard for some people, but I'm just really good at it. Like I could sleep so long on planes. So I think it's, if you're, if it's nighttime in your destination, when you take off, even if it's the afternoon, you need to go to sleep right away. So I'll go to sleep right away. I'll skip meals, whatever. And then I'll, you know, I'll ask for food when I wake up, when it's supposed to be the regular time, I'll even set an alarm. And I think that's the, for me, that's the best way. I was a little trite, but no, just kidding. What is your biggest pet peeve? I really dislike it when people weigh in on things they don't actually understand, which is oh, I, I was, in my mind. No, I'm just kidding. It's, it's like 99.9% of things, right? We, there's no way we can know so many things, but everybody has so many opinions. Uh, so yeah, I mean, like somebody might ask me, well, what do you think about this? And if I don't know, I'll just say, sorry, I don't know enough to weigh in. And I just don't understand why that's so hard for most yeah. people to do. <laughs> that's a great point. And here's a list of 10 reasons why you're wrong. <laughs> Well, Sarah, this has been fantastic and been a a little mental vacation. So thank you so much. Where's the best place for people to connect with you and learn more about Bell and Bly? Yeah, so uh, bellandblytravel.com is our website. Um, Also, definitely check out our podcast, Luxury Travel Insider. We're having amazing conversations with the best hoteliers and tour operators in the in the entire world so you get to hear kind of their inside stories and then on instagram you can find me at sarah goes global sarah with an h awesome sarah goes global and your podcast is awesome you have a new new number one fan in me so thank you for that last thing here final thoughts the stage is yours it could be a quote it could be i don't know like a motto or something trite send us off here The answer is always no if you don't ask. Definitely my life motto. Which is why I asked Sarah for her final thoughts. Thank you, Sarah, for sharing your amazing tips, life motto, secrets on traveling and beyond. And thank you, Wild listeners, for tuning in to another episode. If you want to hear more wild stories like this one, make sure to subscribe to this podcast on your favorite app, check us out on Good Pods, and share the Wild Business Growth Podcast with a friend. You can also find out more about podcast production or get help with your podcast at maxpodcasting.com. 
Until next time, let your business run wild. Bring on the bongos! Bongos!